we forgotten the love Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for this ummah? Have we forgotten the love Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for you and I? Have we forgotten the worry and concern Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for this ummah, had for you and I? Have we forgotten the favors and blessings we were showered with because of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Have we forgotten the wounds that were inflicted on the person of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of this ummah, because of you and I? Have we forgotten the blood that came out of the blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of this ummah? Have we forgotten the tears that rolled down Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's eyes and the tears he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shed because of this ummah? Today, we have forgotten the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, we neglect the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, we have no value for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have no value for his sunnah. My brothers, today, we neglect the rights of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask you, did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever forget you once? inspiring when you saw him he was monumental grand in nature his face was like a moon on Laylatul Badr that had a light coming out of it like the moon on Laylatul Badr he was taller than a, a moderate build but not exceedingly tall but he was of a middle stature inclining towards heights because everything about him was middle Everything, even his physical description, his color was a middle color. Lamikun Amhaq. He wasn't pasty white and he wasn't black. He was a color like the, what we call the harvest moon. And his hair was neither straight nor curly. It was wavy. It was middle. Everything about him was middle. He didn't speak slow and he didn't speak fast. He speaked in a moderate tone. His words were neither too short nor were they excessive, but they were always just right. When he spoke, people felt as if exactly the right amount of words were used. Everything about him was moderation. He had a full head, and his, his hair was wavy. If he parted it, then it parted. It never went past the lobes of his ears if he allowed it to go long, because sometimes he would cut it for ibadah, like the umrah or the hajj, when he shaved. But when he let it, it went to the lobes of his ears and in some riwaya, just above the shoulder. He had a large forehead, which in physiognomy traditionally was an indication of high quality. And then his eyebrows, they were full and there was a slight space between them. And then he had a vein on his forehead that if he got upset, they could see the vein, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The upper part of his nose was aquiline. So he had a beautiful nose that had a, like a bridging on the upper part. And his eyes were very dark. Sahal al Khaddain. He had a high, beautiful cheek. He had a, a mouth that was full. So that when he spoke, he was, his pronunciation was perfect. His teeth were beautiful. There was slight space in the teeth. He had a light hair on his chest. His neck was like a gazelle's neck. He had a beautiful neck and a high neck. It had like a, a beautiful, like a silvery clarity to it. He was balanced in all of his outward aspects. Badinan, he had a strong build, mutamasikan, and it was all perfectly formed. His stomach and his chest were equal. He never had a large stomach he had no punch even when he was in his uh, 60s his stomach was always flat he was full chested and his shoulders were broad and he had a large bone also his trachea where it met there 
there was space and then he had a light hair also on his stomach sallallahu alaihi wasallam ariyat tajain he had no hair over his breast he had hair on his arms and some on his shoulders and the upper part of his chest and he was had large full hands and full palms and his feet were arched and he was sinewy and strong limbs were strong and he had full calves but his feet were so smooth that water would pour off sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then when he walked he walked softly quick paced as if he was walking on an incline when he looked to somebody he didn't just turn like this he moved his entire body sallallahu alaihi wasallam to give full attention to that person he looked more at the ground than he did uh, up his his glance was generally down because of the power of his glance and then uh, most of his looking was mulahaba when he looked at people he didn't maintain his stare he would look and then move away so as he looked at people he never fixed his focus on people uh, because uh, of of the effect that that would have on the people he was always grief stricken what that means is that if you looked at him like if you saw him in the mosque sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam if you saw him in the mosque and you looked at him you would think that he was grief stricken because the istighraq his presence with his lord was so intense that his face would have a sense of being completely absorbed in thought he smiled he always looked at people and smiled and made them feel joyful he never made people feel depressed he laughed at things that they laughed at and aisha said kana mazahan fil bayt he was always joking with us in the house i joke but i never tell a lie in my jokes always i speak the truth a man came to me he said ya rasulullah a'inni jamalak let me borrow a camel he said now ta'tika walad naqa i'll give you a baby of a she camel he said what would that benefit me a baby of a she cuz he wanted to ride it he said doesn't every camel isn't that a baby of a she camel sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then another time a woman ajuz came up to him and said ya rasulullah adkhul al janna am i going to go to paris he said la tadkhul anna al janna ajuz old women don't go to paradise and she became so upset and then he laughed and said satadkhulina shabba you're going to go in young and youthful and then she was happy another time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he laughed at things one man came to him said ya rasulullah halaktu he said ma dahat waqa'tu zawjti fi ramadan i slept with my wife in ramadan and i made an oath that i wouldn't and i hadn't made the takfir because in sharia you have to make the kafara if you do a dihar or uh, the ila or anything that prohibit a man from what he said what did you do oh, ma hamalaka ala dhalika what made you do that he said ya rasulullah ra'ayta bayad hislayha fil qamri fa waqa'tu alayha he said i saw my wife in the moonlight and i couldn't help myself and the bahika rasulullah he laughed at the man he said la taf'a dhalika no kaffir go and do your t- uh, the expiation daim al fikra he was always reflecting he had he didn't take rest like other people he was concerned about his ummah he never spoke about uh, anything that was unnecessary he had long periods of silence he used to open his words and close them with a full expression when he spoke he spoke with comprehensive words sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never had excess he was never of, of a loss of words he had soft and gentle character dimmat al akhlaq he was not harsh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not harsh fa bi rahmatin min allah linta la is by a mercy of your lord that you were gentle and if you were harsh hearted they would have fled from around you he wasn't gruff or harsh ever he always elevated the blessing even if it was a minute blessing he never found fault in anything even a small amount of food any type of food that was given to eat he didn't find fault in it nor did he excessively praise 
he never, uh, there was never anything because if he got upset, it never put him in a state of agitation. There was never a time when a right was presented to him except that he would go to fulfill that right. He never got upset for himself, nor did he ever seek any redress for a wrong done to him. He didn't point with his finger, he pointed with the whole hand. And he would say, Subhanallah, Yaqribu Kafu, Subhanallah, Ida Ta'ajiba. If he spoke, he would put his right thumb into his left palm, like that when he was speaking. Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Most of his laughing was smiling. He rarely uh, laughed the way most people laugh. He smiled. But when he smiled, his teeth were like hailstones. And then Hassan said, I didn't tell Al Hussein ibn Ali about this because they were young. And he said, I didn't tell Hussein. I kept this from him for a long time. He had some knowledge that Hussein didn't have. And then finally I told him about it and I found that he had actually gotten it before me. And he would always occupy people in what benefited them and the ummah. And he would ask about them. And he would ask about news about them. How are they doing and how so and so. And if can he tafaqadu ashabu? If somebody wasn't there, he would say, where's so and so? And the old woman who used to clean the, the masjid, she used to sweep the masjid out. And one day she died, they buried her. And he came, he said, Where's that woman that used to, she was a black woman. Where's the woman who used to sweep the masjid? They said, she died, Ya Rasulullah. He said, why didn't you tell me she died? You know, why didn't you tell me she died to go pray on her? Well, she, she's insignificant. And he would actually ask people, tell me, if you know anybody in need, come and tell me about them so I can help them. And then he told them that those people who help other people who are not able to go and get help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make firm their feet on the day of judgment. You know, take, looking after people, just taking care of people, this is all just, <laughs> it's like just, he's just teaching people how to be human beings. I mean, that, this, this is all it is. You know, we're just learning how, is, it's like human beings don't know how to be human. You know, this is, this is the whole point. It's, this is all just to teach you just to be human beings. He loved to go up to the mountain of, uh, go up into the cave of Hira and contemplate the situation that his people and humanity was in and the vices that were happening and so on. And on that mountain, the Prophet ﷺ, you can imagine the fear that comes to a person when you're just alone in a cave on the top of a mountain and then a man appears. And so he's on, and then the man is telling him to read. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to him, he said, I can't read. And a lot of people forget this part about that story, and many of you are familiar with it. Jibreel, السلام, Angel Jibreel, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ and he squeezed him. And he pressed him so hard. So not only the fear of seeing that person there, but he pressed him so hard until the Prophet ﷺ said, I felt I was going to die. And then he let go of him. And then he said, read. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I can't read. And then he squeezed him again until the Prophet ﷺ said that I felt I was going to die. And then he said to him, read. He said, I can't read. And then he pressed him again until he felt he was going to die. And then Jibreel السلام, told him, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he was walking away and he saw Jibreel in this stance in another point afterwards he saw Jibreel in his original creation covering the entire horizon Nobody saw Jibreel, but the Prophet ﷺ saw him. And so he came home frightened. And his wife Khadija, she said, what's wrong? And he said, just cover me up. And he was shaking. He said, zab miluni, zab miluni. He said, just cover me up. The Prophet ﷺ was so scared about what had taken place. 
And in fact, after that, Khadija radiallahu anhu, you'll see in the seerah, she said, Allah would never do this to you. Allah would never disgrace you or humiliate you because you fulfill the ties of kinship. You're good to the orphans. If anybody needs help, you're the one who helps them. You feed them, you take care of them, you will never be humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet sallallahu after that, revelation discontinued. You will see that for many months, Jibreel didn't come back until he felt that Allah was angry with him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one of the first surahs to be revealed amongst after Surah Iqra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received, uh, revealed Surah Al-Duha. وَالْضُحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the daybreak that He hasn't abandoned you and He's not angry with you. And so it's a preparation to prepare the Prophet sallallahu for the enormous tests that are about to come. Even though he was treated so badly by all the people of the city. Listen to this carefully brothers and sisters. I have a very important message here. He never ever generalized. Every single individual was a potential Muslim and a potential good person. The Prophet peace be upon him has left us these words. He said, keep relations with those who cut you off. And do good to people even if they harm you. And speak the truth even if it is against yourself. If you met him, you will think that Muhammad Sallallahu loves you the most. Because of the way he used to treat every person, individually with sensitivity and he used to analyze what is sensitive to you and avoid it until you would think that he loves you the most every single companion thought they were the most beloved and this way the Prophet ﷺ kept the unity of his companions and abolished, uh, abolished the jealousy and the hatred and the envy that could exist between them so each one of them was a special character for him and this is the way the Prophet ﷺ teaches us to deal towards one another ourselves and towards our children. Not to try and show the favorism of one to another. He said, I was amongst the crowd hustling and jostling and shoving to come and see the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, when I saw him, the first impression I had of him, he said, I knew that his face was not the face of a liar. This is not a man that told lies. In other words, the honesty and the beauty, the inner beauty and the outer beauty combined. Abdullah ibn Salam saw this from the Prophet Sallallahu and he said he accepted Islam right then and there. In other words, Abdullah ibn Salam converted just by seeing the Prophet Sallallahu and then hearing the very first words that came out of his mouth. Such was the power, such was the beauty, such was the perfection that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala blessed our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with. So he used to say to them, Behold, we have been sent a people to take the people from the worship of created things to the worship of the Creator of all things and to save the people from injustice into the openness and mercy of Islam and to bring justice to the earth. Do not kill an old man of your, amongst your enemies if he is not fighting you. Do not kill a woman who is not fighting you. Wallahi, even she is in the ranks of the enemies. Do not kill a child. Do not cut up the branches of trees. Do not kill an animal. And do not ruin soil. And do not be excessive in killing. Do not mutilate the bodies. And look after the affairs and the conditions of war. And if you hold captives out of this war, then feed them from what you feed from your, fo your family. And treat them well as you would treat a guest. For they are your captives and you have power over them. And Allah does not like people who have oppression over the weak ones when they have power over them. One day, Rasulullah was traveling with his companions. And time of Qaylula came, the midday nap. 
and he was napping alone on one side and others companions each one was napping on different places at that time the mushriks were very hostile against them suddenly rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam while laying down um, excuse me a mushrik by the name of awras ibn al harith holding the sword at the neck of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it says awras man yamna'uka minni now who is going to save you from me now rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the peace of a messenger of allah said allah and the sword fell from the hand of the mushrik and then held the sword to the neck of Hawrath and said who is going to save you from me now and the story is not over the man said kun khayra akhir bi abi anta ummi ya rasulullah he said kun khayra akhir bi a generous taker. Take this from me generously. You know what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did? wa taraka. He pardoned him and let him go free. So they used to say to them, to the companions, to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salaamu Alaikum, fast becoming Salaamu Alaikum, and they mean death be upon you. And the companions knew that, and Rasulullah Sallallahu knew that. That was, they were hostile tribes, some of them. So he was walking with Aisha, one of them passes and says, Salaamu Alaikum. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered, Wa Alaikum, and upon you. Not laughing, one lies. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was with Rasulullah sallallahu says, Wa alaykum usamu, wa ghadib Allahu alaykum, wa la'anakum, wa a'adda lakum a'daban azima, something like that. Then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala replied, and may death be upon you, and the anger and the wrath of Allah azza wa jal. She was hurt. And that's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa not just her husband. Well, that's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then, subhanAllah, in this occasion, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this, this ocean of peace, subhanAllah. He says to Aisha, Mahlan ya Aisha. Mahlan ya Aisha. In other words, like what? Take it easy, Aisha. Mahlan ya Aisha. The Prophet said people were rude to him. The desert Arabs were rude to him. And he never returned their rudeness with rudeness. He smiled in their faces. He returned their bad manners with good character. And this is what he taught us to do with people. Patience. When, when the, the woman who was in the graveyard and, and, and she was mourning over and the Messenger of Allah passed by her and he, and he said, that uh, this is a musibah and you should be patient. And she said, you didn't have the tribulation that I had. That's how she answered him. And he just left her. Now look at the character there. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? I'm the messenger of Allah. You can't talk to me like that. He didn't say that. He saw she was mus she, musab. She was in tribulation. He left her to be in her tribulation. He gave her nasiha and she didn't accept it. But he recognized her psychological state. She was in a state that it was not useful or beneficial to continue with her and so he left her I, this is wisdom this is hikmah and then he went to his house and somebody came by and he and and he said don't you know who that was that was the messenger of Allah. suddenly remorse entered her heart Astaghfirullah. and she went to his house and knocked on the door ya rasulallah i didn't know it was you patience that allah wants is at that point 
That's the point Allah does not want you to lose control. To forgive your brother for Allah's sake, to forgive your sister for Allah's sake, not for them, to do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really, there's people in here that haven't talked to their brother or their sister or some of them to their mothers and their fathers. Don't be that person. Don't cut off your bloodship bonds. Don't be that person. Do it for the sake of Allah. And a man came to the Messenger of Allah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Asilu Akhi, Wayaktauni, Uatihi, Wayamnauni, Uwasiluhu, Wala Yuasilu. I give him, he withholds. I come to him, he cuts me off. What should I do? He said, That is Sidat al Rahm, that what you're doing is the right thing and continue to do it even though he's cutting you off. That's Islam. That's Islam. And it's hard. Don't think this is an easy religion. Rasul will come to the house in the noontime. He used to have something called Qailula. Putting his head and where? In the laps of Aisha. Resting his head in her lap. That's how close they were. She said sometimes when he used to do ihtikaf, he will give her his head because his, the message is close to his room and she will walk in his head. You know, braid his head, hair. They sit together to eat. Rasulullah take a piece of food, bite of food. He put something in her mouth, something in his mouth. He will call her with beautiful names. Then he said, Ya Humaira, Ya Bint al Siddiq. Beautiful names. He said, Or oh, the daughter of the trustworthy or the honest, meaning al Siddiq. He called Aisha, Ya Aish is a nickname. He named Aisha, he called her Aish. Beautiful ways of calling her. Not only that, say the Aisha said, Rasulullah he hint if he doesn't like something, he will not say, I don't like this. Okay? Give a hint. One time, Aisha and Rasulullah have dispute. Disagreed, husband and wife. Rasulullah said, let us look for a mediator. Somebody to mediate this conflict we have. He's a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Doesn't that, that make you love him more? He said, we have dispute agreement. Can you bring a mediator? She said, okay, whom you choose? He said, Umar. She said, no, I don't like it. I don't like to have Umar to be mediator. And that's normal. This is a normal life. He said, how about your father? He said, okay, how about my father? When they came, see the patient of Rasulullah the decency of this man. They sat, Rasulullah said, should I start or you should start? He said, you start and say nothing but the truth. Whom she talking about? She's talking about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr get angry. He jumped on, the jumping on his daughter said, وَهَلْ يَقُولُ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ يَا شَقِيَّةً doesn't he speak nothing but the truth? What's wrong with you? Rasulullah stopped him. He said, Abu Bakr, I did not call you for this. I didn't call you to, to punish your daughter. We come here to mediate. Keep the other things, just filter it. Then Abu Bakr mediated with Rasulullah. After that, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left. Rasulullah and Aisha, they had a meal together. They started eating. Nothing happened. Abu Bakr, because the father, the father-in-law, radiallahu anhu, can enter any time the house. He came and found them eating. He said, what happened? You called me when you were having dispute, and now we're having food. What happened? Why didn't you invite me? Joking with them. This is the life that the Rasulullah used to live. You look into the love that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every Sahabi radiallahu anhum mentioned that when we were in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we actually felt that we were the closest person to him. 
This is the love that he would show. When he would shake their hand, there was no man who was more busier than the Prophet ﷺ. But when he would shake their hands, he would not release it until they pull their hands back. When he would speak to them, he would turn totally towards them. And this is why the Sahaba anhum loved the Prophet ﷺ. When Khubayb ibn Adi anhu was captured by the Mushrikeen, and he was brought to the outskirts of Mecca, and this is approximately where Masjid Aisha is today. And they wanted to kill him slowly. So they began to cut his flesh. And then they began to pierce him with their swords and their spears. And whilst he was going through this excruciating pain, Abu Sufyan, who was not a Muslim at the time, came to him. And he said, Oh Khubayb, don't you prefer that Muhammad was in your place and you were in the comforts of your home? And whilst he was going through this pain, he said, I swear by Allah, and it's easy for me to say it, and it's easy for you to listen. He said, I swear by Allah, death is easier for me than a thorn prick the Prophet wasallam. And the Prophet wasallam was sitting in Medina whilst it was going on. And then Khubayb asked them, could he read two rakats? And they allowed him to pay two rakats. And whilst he, when he finished, he turned toward the mushrikeen and he said, I've prayed two very short rakat because I didn't want you to think that I was scared of death. And then he supplicated to Allah. He said, oh Allah, we believed in the Prophet Sallallahu We believed in you and we followed the precept of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now convey my salams to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Medina and Osama bin Zayd radiallahu anhu was sitting next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, all of a sudden, I saw the eyes of the Prophet Sallallahu well up. I, say his, I saw his tears begin to flow. And he said, Khubayb has just sent his salams. But it was on this occasion that Abu Sufyan, when he heard the reply of Khubayb, that death is easier for me than a thorn prick the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that it was on this occasion that Abu Sufyan said, I have sat with the emperors of Persia and I have sat with the emperors of Rome and I've seen the way their followers love them and I've seen how Muhammad's followers love him and I swear by Allah the followers of the Roman and the Persian emperors don't love them like Muhammad's followers love him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was an object worth loving and this is why when the Prophet peace be upon him came to Medina he would give his Juma khutbah, leaning upon a tree trunk. And then a lady came to him and she said, I have a slave who's a very good carpenter. If you wish, I will ask him to make a pulpit for you. And he agreed. And, the, and he came the next week and he ascended the pulpit. And they say, when he ascended the pulpit, and that the tree trunk, some narration mentioned that it began to shake like it was about to explode. Other narration mentioned it was like a she camel whose child had been dragged away from it. Others mentioned it was like a small child who had lost his parents. Others mentioned that it was like cried and it screamed like a mother, like a she camel when she's giving birth. And the Prophet peace be upon him descended from the pulpit and he embraced it and the sobbing slowly stopped. And then it gave it an opportunity and a choice to be a tree in Jannah from which the awliya and the sulaha eat from its fruits. And they chose to be a tree in Jannah. When they migrated, where Abu Bakr entered into the cave and he wanted to clean it up and he saw a number of holes and he took off his garment and he shredded it into small pieces and he put, filled the holes. And then he requested the Prophet Sallallahu to come in and the Prophet came inside and then he lay on his flat thigh and then there was one hole which he had no garment left for so he stuck his foot upon it and in that in that hole there was a snake and it bit the foot of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu can you imagine the pain and he was going through this pain and he didn't want to wake up his beloved and then the tears began to flow down his cheeks and they fell on the blessed cheek of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam woke up 
and he saw what Abu Bakr was going through and he took his saliva and he placed it upon his foot and it was as though he had never been bit by a snake when everybody else crumbled and Abu Bakr remained firm you know why I often say that whilst everybody else were rejoicing Abu Bakr anhu was crying when the verses of Surah Nas Iza ja'a Nasrullah wal Fat were revealed when the help of Allah will descend and you will see people entering into the deen upon army upon army the Sahaba were rejoicing the help of Allah is gonna come the conquests are gonna come and Abu Bakr was sitting in the corner crying why? because he understood that the latter verses were revealed regarding the demise of the Prophet and he sat there crying when the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave this final khutbah two days before he passed away, he felt better and he came and he prayed salah behind Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr was going to move back and he told him, remain on your place. I mean, what kind of, what kind of greater honor can you have than that? The man who led the Anbiya in salah, Abu Bakr had the honor of leading him in salah. And then the Prophet sallallahu ascended the pulpit and he gave this par parable, this example of a man who has been given a choice of remaining in the dunya or moving unto his Lord. And he had chosen to move unto his Lord. And all the other Sahaba thought it was just an example, a parable. But Abu Bakr understood that it was referring to the Prophet peace be upon him. And he began to cry uncontrollably. And Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu anhu mentioned, I saw him crying and I was thinking, why is this old man crying for? And then the Prophet sallallahu saw him and he said, Oh Abu Bakr, calm down, Abu Bakr, calm down. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, Subhanallah, he said, whoever, whoever has done me a favor in this dunya, I have repaid their favor. As for the favors of Abu Bakr, Allah, we repay him on the day of judgment. And if I was to take anybody as a friend, I would have taken Abu Bakr as a friend. But the brotherhood of Islam is enough. And then he said, all the doors to the masjid should be closed. Illa khawkhata Abu Bakr, beside the door of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And the day he passed away, this was the day Umar radiallahu anhu was referring to. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came into the masjid. You could have imagine the state of the Sahaba the Prophet said, if anybody is ever afflicted with a calamity, then remember my death because it will dwarf any other calamity. And you have to be amongst those people who live with the Prophet to really understand what he meant. And Abu Bakr had cried, is crying. So when the Prophet passed away, he came into the masjid, he passed through the masjid. And the blessed body was lying in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. And he came into the house and he removed the sheet from the blessed face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he kissed him upon his forehead and he said, Tibta hayyan wa mayyatan ya Rasulallah. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, you are beautiful in life and you are as beautiful in death. the Sahaba felt when Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died? What do you think that they went through? When a member of our family dies, how do we feel? The closer the member, the more we feel. Some of us don't even know whether it's day or night. This is how sad we are. And it is only natural to be sad at the time of death and at the loss of one's close ones. How do you think the Sahaba felt when Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died? Because this was not the death of an ordinary man. It was the death of the best of creation. It was the death of that person. Okay, they could not even tolerate separation from him. Not even for a second. The one they loved more than themselves, their family, their children, everything. Now bearing this in mind, I want you to tell me, how do you think that these people felt when Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this world? This is why when we pick up the books of Ahadith and the books on Sirah and Tariq, we find 
Hazrat Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu is motionless. There is no harakat whatsoever. There is no movement. He does not know what has happened. Hazrat Ali there and then falls unconscious. The general Sahaba are saying, Wallahi wa didna anna mitna qabla. Only if Allah had not shown us this day. Only if we had died before this. This was the general situation of the Muslims. Now look at the situation of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. This is Abu Bakr. When this is happening all around him, and this event has torn the Sahaba, and they have lost their patience and their tolerance, he comes. It is the last day. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa told him to lead the prayer. He has led the believers in prayer. And then he comes, and he takes permission from Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa He takes leave for a short while. He makes his way to his home in Sunkh, and he fulfills the need of his family. And then as he is returning, he hears the news. That the messenger of Allah is no more. Saddened, tears begin to flow from his eyes. And the words that are flowing are, That we all belong to the Almighty Allah. And to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will return. He makes haste. He hastens only to realize that this news and this event has done damage. And it, is, and it has tore, tore the Sahaba apart to such an extent that the one that they considered the strongest from amongst them, the one from whom even the devil would run away, he is standing with a sword in his hand and he is saying that the hypocrites claim that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa has died. Wallahi ma mad, by Allah he has not died. Walakinnahu zahba ila rabbih kama zahba Musa ibn Imran. But he has gone to meet his Lord. Just like Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wa salam went and the messenger of Allah will return and he will cut the hands and the feet of those people that are making these claims. By Allah, if Umar hears anyone saying that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa has died, Umar will sever their heads from their body, Umar will kill them. Now if this was the situation of the strongest from amongst them, what do you think was the situation of the general Sahaba and those that had soft hearts and those that were considered weak from amongst the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in? Intellect, Akhil says that if in this situation, the likes of a worker broke, broke down. It would have been justified. Why? Because he was the one that was loved by Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most. When he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, Ayu nasi ahabu alayk, the words that flowed were that I love Abu Bakr the most. He loved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most. He was the one that was with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in childhood. He was the one that was the first to believe in Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the one that embraced him and that accepted him when all others rejected him. He was the one whose house Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose house Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would visit every morning, every evening. He was the one who Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would consult. He was the one that stayed with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every delicate moment. He was with him in Uhud. He was with him in Badr. He was with him in Khandaq. You name it, he was with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If in a situation like this, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu broke down, it would be justified. But look at Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. He comes. He takes permission from his daughter, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. He enters her house. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is lying in one corner, covered with cloth. He comes and he uncovers the cloth and he kneels down and he begins to kiss the blessed face of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with tears flowing from his eyes. And then he says, Laysa ma yukulu ibn al-Khattabi shi'a. The wafiya Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, what ibn al-Khattabi is saying is wrong. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has left the world. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has died. Rahmatullah alayka ya Rasulullah. Ma atibuka hayyin wa mayyita. Allah's blessings be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. Saying this, looking at the delicate situation and looking at the Sahaba and the Muslims, he leaves and he makes his way to the masjid and he delivers a sermon to strengthen the Muslims and to console them and to bring them back. And he tells the Sahaba, O oh my companions, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had informed you that he was going to leave this world. Allah had informed you that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to die. When Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive, whilst he was amongst you, Allah also told you that you are also to die. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not say, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولُ أَفَعِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمَ لَا قَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ قِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَدُرُ اللَّهِ شِيعًا وَ 
to die. Everything will come to an end. Only your Lord will remain. Every soul will test. Every soul will, 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 will taste death. Oh people, whoever worship the Almighty Allah, the Almighty Allah is alive. The Almighty Allah does not die. Whoever took Muhammad as his Lord, then Muhammad remains no more. Fear the Almighty Allah and grab hold of your deen. It is only after the sermon do the, do the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala majma'in come around to the extent that the likes of Umar when he Abu Bakr recited the verse of the Quran وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ unto him Sayyidina Abu Bakr Umar radiallahu ta'ala who says that it was like as if this word words of the Quran had not been revealed prior to this disgrace you or humiliate you because you fulfill the ties of kinship you're good to the orphans if anybody needs help you're the one who helps them you feed them you take care of them you will never be humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala